Yeah. Joy made me iron my shirt this morning. She said, oh, you can't, you can't go to John with wrinkles in your shirt. And I'll show on the camera. So about five minutes before I left, I had to press up the shirt, which had been sitting in the back of the car. So I want to know that she's concerned about you. Did she ever phone you? Uh, regarding... You asked the day I phoned you. You yeah, said, she oh, did. Have, she did. Oh, she good. did, yeah. yeah I, I needed a, a phone number for the fellow that started the totem theater. Oh, Not right. his name, but she gave me a number. I've spoken to him, so he's ready to go if I can get to him. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I, it'll be fairly chronological, so we'll go through okay. your starting in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe just as sort of an overview, uh, you were at the University of Alberta. In Edmonton, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, what was the the theater scene like? What was there for people in terms of uh, in Edmonton? In Edmonton, and and maybe if you can carry on to Calgary. Right, sure. Well, I mean, uh, we're talking about the the beginning of the fifties when I was at university, um, and so the, the the theater scene in Alberta was all amateur, very active. It was kind of the the uh, culmination of all that work in theatre that had gone on since the 20s in Alberta. In the department, uh, I went into an education faculty because there was a drama program. They decided that they would train drama teachers. Alberta's quite distinctive in as much as it's very early uh, in the school curriculums that drama is introduced. So there was a chance to be a drama teacher and to assuage my parents that it wasn't a foolish decision to be in the theatre. I agreed that I would do a teaching degree in drama. So I went to Edmonton, and uh, I think you got to do about two drama courses a year. There was a, a really interesting man heading the department, a man called Robert Orchard. A bit wild, a bit madman, English type, very artistic, uh, full of enthusiasm, and, and a wonderful woman who was pivotal, pivotal rather, in the, the development of drama in Alberta, a woman called Elizabeth Sterling Haynes. So that was very good training, and out of that, uh, let's see what was going on in Edmonton at the time. Well, Bob Orchard had organized a theatre out of the department called the Studio Theatre, which still exists in Edmonton, and it was in an old converted Quonset hut, and uh, that became the principal space for drama on the campus, and it was a nice mix of town and gown, and uh, I worked with uh, all the, all the kind of distinguished people of Edmonton's amateur theatre who had worked over the years with Elizabeth and, and worked with the students from, from the university. And that was a very good combination. They had a lot to teach me and I, I think I learned a lot out of those years. Calgary was very much the same scene, except it didn't have the university, and so not quite the same push to get on with things artistic. It always seemed to me, unloyal as it is, that Edmonton was a bit ahead mm -hmm. as far as things... Uh, like the development of theatre and the development of opera and the development of ballet, all seemed to start in Edmonton and eventually Calgary, being a rival city, would pick up on them. And in Calgary at that time, I suppose the most distinguished theatre was Workshop 14, which was Betty Mitchell's group, which was the alumni of her drama programs at Western Canada High School. And they'd gone on to win the Dominion D Drama Festival one year, which was Oh, the, the mark of ultimate approval in amateur theatre in Canada in those days was a big thing. And I remember going down from Edmonton with a production uh, that Bob Orchard had done at the studio and uh, these two rival theatres, because the studio had developed some sort of reputation by them, met head-on in the festival and we were sadly trounced by <laughs> Betty Mitchell, I remember that. And then uh, what happened was I, I'd always had this desire to be in the theatre and I, I suppose I'd pretended to my parents that I really wanted to be a drama teacher. But I finished my degree and Elizabeth Haynes persuaded me, well it didn't take much persuasion, she made it possible for me to go to England to uh, get to a theatre school in England because there was no training schools in, in Canada and the only other choice would have been to go to the States and I, at that time I had no desire to do that. I think the, the major thing was there had been uh, a visit by the old Vic Company to New York in the f late 40s. Uh, and, uh, Ralph Richardson and uh, Olivier and Sybil Thorndike. And it was a huge success and it was widely covered by the magazines. There was a big spread in Life magazine and I thought, that's what I want to do. That's the kind of theatre I want to be in. So I, uh, 
I set my sights on the old Vic school, which was probably the, at that time the most prestigious English school. And to get there, I had to, you could audition in New York or audition in London, both seem a long way from the prairies. But Michel Saint Denis, the director of the school, was there at, in Calgary adjudicating the Dominion Drama Festival. So I went down and met the great Frenchman and auditioned for him in his hotel room. And he said, oh yes, you come. But my parents said, no, no, finish your degree first. I think I had another year to go. So I finished my degree and then was asked to re-audition. Fortunately, the adjudicator for the festival that year was Pierre Lefebvre, who was Saint Denis' assistant. So I re-auditioned and again was accepted and was waiting at home to go. Got a letter saying that school had closed. Very <laughs> summarily, it was closed. But they had arranged for me to uh, have a place at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, which they still controlled, and some auditions at RADA and at... Uh, Central School. So I went to London and that was 1952 right. and did the auditions for the two London schools and decided I'd, I'd rather go to Bristol and went down to Bristol. Um, going back a little bit, could you tell me a little bit about um, Elizabeth Sterling Haynes and, and what she, you know, maybe a little more, if there's more depth there you can tell me a bit about and what she really meant to... The theatre in Alberta at that yeah. time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, she was from Ontario initially, married to a dentist in Edmonton. Um, had been very active, had, had studied in, in um, New York, theatre in New York, it seemed to me. And then came back to Edmonton, was very active in something called the Civic Theatre in Edmonton. Uh, and was then asked by the head of the Extension Department of the University, a man called Ned Corbett, who had a really strong vision about the university moving out into rural Alberta. This would be in the 30s, in the height of the Depression. And they both agreed that, that the arts were enormously important for people at that time, under those circumstances. And Elizabeth became this great kind of motivator for the province, traveled the province all over and um, would persuade people to come together and form an amateur theatre company and then would give them some guidance, etc, etc. And uh, one of her great accomplishments was there's a very, very small town in Alberta called Clive. And out of that town, out of a group that she formed, they went on and they won the Dominion Drama Festival to the amazement of everyone because it, it was a very establishment-oriented organization. And, there were big names like the London Little Theatre, etc., etc., and this little group from Clive went in and won the festival. And this was a real mark of Elizabeth's achievements. Her other achievement was to organize a drama camp at Banff one summer, 1933, I think. And out of that camp grew the Banff School of Fine Arts and, and the drama program there. Uh, then when Bob Orchard arrived at the university in Oh, I think about 48, Elizabeth was a sort of s uh, sessional lecturer, I suppose. She was certainly the person that one got to, uh, one hoped to, and finally got to work with. An extraordinary woman, a very good actress, a woman of uh, uh, an enormous ethical belief in the theatre. She thought that the theatre was truly important. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, peripheral in any sense to life. So she was a real motivator for a great number of people out of Edmonton at that time, and, and throughout the province, too. Um, do you think, when you think of her, do you think of anything that she gave you personally in terms of acting that taught you about acting that do you keep with you today, or was it just the motivator? That's funny. Uh, well, certainly a belief that theatre has real relevance and therefore it's truly important. A feeling, uh, I suppose, uh, if one ever does any slipshod work, have a feeling that Elizabeth somewhere standing behind your shoulder scolding you because she insisted on the best that you could, that you could manage. And, and as an amateur and as a, a person learning, those were important things to see that no matter what I was doing on stage, it was important to give my all. And I think that's the major contribution. Also, uh, she had, because she had studied in New York uh, in the 30s, I 
began to be introduced a bit to, to the Stanislavski system. Uh, she was very keen on that. And although everyone read the books, most people knew little as to how to apply the method. And out of, uh, from Elizabeth, I got, I think, the first stirrings in my own techniques about how to use that inner uh, workings that you bring to a role. Yeah, no, she's a, she's a very important molder of my, of my ethical aesthetic um, and uh, judgment and, and my technique, I suppose. We talked earlier the other day about um, a comparison in terms of styles and Betty Mitchell, and I wonder if you might sort of talk a little bit about the differences, or, and I guess what Betty uh, brought to, uh, to the establishment of theatre. Right. They, they, they were both, uh, they, it's interesting to make the comparison because they were always being compared in the province. You were either a devotee of Elizabeth's or if you are a devotee of, of Betty Mitchell's. And what Betty brought to the theatre was a high theatricality. She, uh, she was initially a farm girl driving around in a tractor, had gone to university, been in a play directed by Elizabeth Haynes, and it was a woman no, it would be uh, Lady Windermere's fan, and she played Mrs. Allenby, and Elizabeth always used to say that she played it at 20 and has been playing it ever since. There was this style, uh, this glamour of the theatre that she brought to a small provincial city in the 40s in Calgary. And, 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 and a woman of considerable theatrical taste and, and a very strong, uh, a, a strong motivator of young people. So that they worked hard and they worked for excellence and that excellence was recognised because they won a couple of uh, drama festivals, the Dominion Drama Festivals. As they say, that was always a mark of it, approval. Elizabeth was a very, uh, not a handsome woman. No, she was not a beautiful woman. She was quite a handsome woman, very striking looking. Betty was quite a beautiful woman. They both carried themselves with great poise and dignity and filled the room when they came in. Uh, both had wonderful voices. Betty's best performances were when she went on stage to receive awards. Uh, was a one, she always wore long white gloves and as she walked up the aisle, she would begin to unroll this one glove in order to have it off in order to receive the reward. It was a wonderful performance. I thought always better than the play that she was receiving the award for. That's great. And we didn't um, talk in, previously about this woman, and I'm just, I've been scrambling for her name because she was another pioneer, but not in Alberta. Um, she was in Saskatchewan, and I'm just looking for her. Mary Ellen Burgess? That's right. That yeah. would be... Uh, would, you, would you have any comments about her, or is that a bit of a stretch for you? I, I don't know that much about her. I met her only very late in her career when she had finished. She was an employee of the provincial government again, I think. It was this prairie province thing about the need to promote the arts through government uh, departments. And Mary Ellen was one of these people that rushed all over uh, Saskatchewan and developed a very powerful provincial drama festival, both in the high schools and in the community. Um, her career interlocks with Frances Highlands, I think, at some point. So, and it, so it's just sort of the same thing as in Alberta. If you wanted in those dirty days to get into the theatre, you came into, under the influence of these two powerful women in Alberta and in the Saskatchewan would be Mary Ellen Burgess and then finally Florence James as well. But that's about as much yeah. as I know about her. Uh, you've commented on it, but obviously the Dominion Drama Festival was a big, uh, it really was key, wasn't it, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. giving some credibility to the arts, uh, the competition. And I, I've never known how influential it was in the East, but I assume it must have been. Uh, I remember uh, the festival was held during my university years at the Grand Theatre in Calgary and all these groups came and I, everyone was always in um, dinner jackets and uh, women were always in long gowns and uh, and uh, there were thousands of parties that followed. It was a huge social event among other things and, and uh, the, the, uh, the quality of the work seemed to me in those days very good. Uh, the adjudicator was always bilingual because you had the French and the English groups in competition. Um, you got some very strange adjudications because this, uh, because of this necessary qualification that the adjudicator be fluent in both languages. And so 
Sometimes the adjudications in some of the regional festivals that led up to the Dominion Drama Festival was a bit ropey, I thought. He thought his only qualification is the fact that he can speak French, maybe. But, uh, I mean, there were very distinguished names like uh, Saint-Denis and uh, Robert Spate and, uh, and Pierre Lefebvre, who were very well-recognized names and names with considerable prestige when they came. It was a week-long event. Uh, and then there was a lot of awards at the end. There was Best Actress and Best Actor and Best Supporting Actress and Best Supporting Actor and Best Play in French and Best... You know, it went on forever. But, uh, and, and I think it only faded out in the... It began to change its nature in the... in the six, towards the end of the 60s when people became very critical of the competitive nature of it. And once the competition went, then the festival went too. Mm -hmm. well, that's, even if you don't approve of it, uh, competition is a really strong motivator. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned when you came back from England, I guess it was about 1953, 54? 54, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you'd spent time in England and, and experienced that. Uh, coming to Stratford, uh, did you, do you remember what your first impressions are in terms of the, 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 the uh, theatre and uh, the company? And uh, was it impressive or was it, you know, what was Oh, I was enormously impressed, of course. I, I was a small part player. I'd, I'd been employed as an understudy and a walk-on. And uh, I was covering Doug Rains and uh, who else? Well, a few of the rising young leading lights of Can Canadian theatre, Don Heron. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think I didn't know what to expect. I'd not been in Canada during the first year of the festival and there was so much publicity about it. I'd heard about it through Don Heron, who was in a play at the Bristol Old Vic and told me about the festival and urged me to do, try and find my way into the festival, which I did, and came back to Canada in May and uh, didn't know where Stratford was. It was somewhere west of Toronto, as far as I knew. And got there and went down and there was this huge tent, uh, very impressive structure. And then this incredible theatre. I mean, uh, I suppose in no one of a uh, later generation has a concept of how how strange and how exciting that theatre looked because it really was one of the first thrust theatres. One had never seen anything like that before. And to be in this vast auditorium, this vast circle with this stage so spotlighted in the middle because of the architecture of the building and then this wonderful, flexible stage designed by Tanya Mosevich. Then to meet Guthrie, I mean, no one can meet Tyrone Guthrie for the first time and not be somewhat in awe. First of all, his height is six foot seven. And uh, running around in shorts with a kind of four feet of legs sticking out from underneath them and, uh, and uh, a kind of cheerful uh, energy. Uh, constant delighted if you did anything that he liked. Uh, constantly keeping on the move. Uh, not willing to be bored at all by anything and immediately would change it uh, without being that critical of the actor, making you feel that you just started down the wrong road and we'd come back and try something else. So it was a very supportive atmosphere too. And then all the, the, the leading actors of the company at the time were familiar names to me, familiar because of Canadian, uh, the Canadian stage series on CBC. And over the years I'd listened to stage every Sunday night religiously and I, I knew who Don Heron was, who Lloyd Bachner was, who uh, Robert Christie was, and, and suddenly they were all there in front of me. And, uh, and very, but no one had a great deal of experience of playing Shakespeare. Uh, some of them had had a year with Guthrie, and maybe were feeling a bit more confident, but no one really knew much about doing it. And they were very much willing to be molded, mold, um, molded by Guthrie. And, uh, so you didn't feel the great division in a, in a large company that you might in a, in a more well-established company where there are actors of a certain rank and underneath that actors of another rank. Um, I, I felt that uh, I had a place and deserved a place in the company and was quite pleased to be there. It was very exciting, very exciting. There was there a comradeship the after the performance? I mean, I mean, I've heard of breakfast with Bruno kind of thing. Uh, everyone going over. I mean, was there? Did you sense that, or was that true that there? Oh was yeah, no? it, it was one long party for the summer. 
Uh, yeah, and, and, and you always seem to be included. Uh, there are always things to do. Swimming in the quarry at St. Mary's was a constant activity. I, it was very hard work, and you worked hard, but you only had to put up two plays in those days, and once, and they both opened one day after the other, and after they were up, there were some classes to go to, but apart from that, there was no other demand made on you apart from the understudy rehearsals. So you had lots and lots of free time. Lots and lots of free time. And, uh, and the major stars, people like James Mason, were very approachable, and, and one was entertained by him at certain times. Are you uh, okay? Okay. Um, you talked about Tyrone Guthrie, and there's, I guess, Michael Langan was another. Uh, you, you, you paths would have crossed. I guess, uh, particularly, I guess, in '56, uh, he was partly responsible for bringing uh, the the performance from Quebec. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you may or not. You know, sometimes a director will have a, or like Tyrone or Michael Langan may have a. An impact on, a, on an actor's career. They may not. I just wondered, did either of those people, when you left Stratford, did you take anything away from from that experience? That, or was it? Well, that's. Uh, my time at Stratford proved to me that I didn't know very much about acting, uh, and what I got out of that was the feeling that I wanted further study. I didn't want further study in classical technique. I wanted further study in in a modern technique and I took myself off to New York and I think I probably, those two men were in some way influential with that. Um, out of Stratford I had joined the Crest Theatre in Toronto. The Crest Theatre was a sort of model on an English repertory company and everybody there had a kind of British accent and I had worked at the theatre school in England and with the idea that I would have a career in England and I'd worked very hard to lose my regional accent. So I was stuck with a slightly phony British accent, which I, I suffered through for years and years and years. Uh, it, it was encouraged at the crest because the productions were so often English. And at the same time, I had a very good friend in, in the company, a man called Neil Vipond, who had been down and studied with Uta Hagen. And I remember we both had sort of equal parts in the company that year, and Neil would spend hours preparing. And I thought, well, I mean, he's got at the most 40 lines, so what is it he, he's doing apart from learning the lines and, and delivering them smoothly on stage and knowing where he should be and inventing a bit of clever business. But he had found a method of working that I didn't know much about and I was so intrigued by that that I decided I wanted to go to New York then. Um, remember that in, in Canada at that time there were the only training that was available to you were a few courses in the university and of course universities are traditionally conservative and so what you tended to study mostly was the literature of the theatre, not much practical. There would be people in the university who would encourage you to do plays, like uh, the plays being done at Hart House, which was the training for a lot of Ontario actors in Alberta at the university and here at UBC uh, with Dorothy Somerset. Um, but, but there, there was no solid school at which you could go, so you tended to go either to the States or to England, and a lot of Canadian actors went to England to study. And so we came back with the British technique, and it was... There was no demand for much Canadian acting in those days. That happened later, so we, we all had this slightly second-hand acting technique, and I wanted something more than that. We can't say that the two men were not influential in their way, but they kind of proved to me that to be a Shakespearean actor was not what I wanted to do. I mean, I admired Shakespeare and still do, but that was not what I saw as my future. Having said that, it was interesting because many you mentioned your comment, when the French Canadians came down to Stratford in 56, they were coming from a totally different oh, point yeah. of view. And how did that work, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, their style would have been totally different, and how did that blend, or did it blend, or were there awkward moments in terms of its working together? No, I think it worked, the, the, the French Canadians arriving in Stratford, I, first of all, it was a brilliant stroke, I thought, a wonderful way to make Henry V really relevant to Canadian audiences. Uh, typical of, of Lang, who's a, got a genius for finding the heart, or the controversial heart of a play, it seemed to me. So the idea of inviting these French, distinguished French Canadian actors down to the company was quite something. There, they were very nervous, that's my perception of it, because they were not familiar with Shakespeare, 
that familiar with Shakespeare, except in French translation, no doubt. And they had undoubtedly done Shakespeare in French. But suddenly to be forced to play it in another language, most of them spoke it very well, but it was still their second language, so there were some problems for them in that way. But what was remarkable was the difference in their technique. Uh, they came out of the French tradition. The voice was of supreme importance, so you had that wonderful ability that the French actor has to, to uh, give a lyrical base to the text itself, and at the same time keeping the, the sense of it. Uh, and then they were extremely distinguished in people like Jean Le Roux and Jean Gascon, who eventually took over the theater, the direction of the theater. Uh, a wonderful comedian, Guy Hoffman, who was a, a, one of the great Moliere clowns, uh, playing a small comic part in, front in Henry V, and it became kind of a, a star showcase in the middle of Henry V, was this, this scene with this little nervous Frenchman. Uh, I think they put the, the English-speaking actors on their metal. You know, they had to kind of try to rise to the level of these very powerful French actors who would sweep on the stage with an enormous sense of style and élan, and uh, so you couldn't kind of stumble and mumble as maybe some some English-speaking actors who were by this time being influenced by actors like Marlon Brando and trying to introduce another technique that just didn't wash when you were in this. At the same time, because there was always a difference between the two of them, the, the division and the attitudes of the French court to the English court were crystal clear in the production. I went to see Mums the Word because a friend uh, of uh, friends in Calgary's daughter was in it and one of the originators, but she wasn't in it. I enjoyed it very much. I thought it was really splendidly done. And I'm going to go to the Fringe tonight. Well, I started, I guess. It starts today, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Too busy, I'd like to. Uh, are we ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, I had a couple of quotes here um, about the crest, I guess, in terms of describing it. Professional standards at the crest were always the highest in Toronto by far, but the appearance of insouance, I guess is the word, of an in-group having fun <coughs> always gave the crest a grown-up little air, little theater air. Is, oh, oh. Would that be... Would you, is that how you would describe the crest? No, no, How would no, you describe don't. the crest? Mm, I'm, I'm not... There's another, well, there's, another, there's another one. The Crest was a commercial theatre in a way that Jupiter was not, and although it succeeded in its way to give Canadian theatre workers valuable experience, it veered away from the activist line started by the New Play Society and the Jupiter. Would the that, activist line? I always thought those two of the companies were very traditional. Is that right? Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, there, there was just no alternative theatre at all in Toronto. Uh, to say that the crest moved away, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it had a very strong English base. It was very much like a theatre that you would find in Guildford, except run by Canadians. And, uh, and I suppose the dominance of the family of uh, Donald and Murray uh, and uh, of their sister, Barbara Chilcott, uh, gave it a sense of being an in-group. I mean, they'd started the theatre in order that they could be on stage. Uh, maybe that's a selfish motivation, but they were spending all their money in keeping this stage going, so it's only reasonable that they should have been in the plays. And there was a resentment, I suppose, because most casts featured either Donald Davis or Murray Davis or Barbara, and sometimes all three. But they were enormously supportive of, of actors. Maybe because I had been taken into the company, I felt protected, but I also felt enormously encouraged by them, given all kinds of wonderful opportunities as a young actor. And, uh, as I say, I had this wonderfully phony British accent, so I fitted right in if they were doing something like hay fever. Uh, but I remember doing some, we did a, a couple of new Canadian plays. They did a uh, premiere of uh, Robertson Davies while I was there. There wasn't very much Canadian playwriting going on at the time of any real quality in, in, in English Canada anyway. And what there was, they seemed to produce. I've always thought they had a very bad press in Canada, and, 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 and in my prejudiced view, undeserved. And a lot of that, I would have assumed, came from Nathan Cohen. I guess he was a very harsh critic of... Uh, what did well, you he, 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 he was... Oh, I loved him. I thought he was a marvelous man. He was a very entertaining man, and in many ways he was a very kind and encouraging man. He liked my work, but I do that helped. True, his, his reviews could be devastating, but I always thought that they were 
on the basis of what he thought the theatre should be. They were never in any sense to me personal. They were not personal attacks. The other critic, the major critic at the time, was Herbert Whitaker. And Herbert had a feeling that theatre needed to be encouraged. So often what seemed to me worthy of criticism, he would find a way of approving. And I suppose if you really pushed him, he might say, there, well, there's something wrong with that. But not in the press because he wanted people to come to the theatre. Nathan had as much interest in the development of the theatre in Canada as Herbert, but went at it a different way. This should be better. These people should be better than they're, what they're doing. That, that was the basis of the criticism. Yeah. Did you have any particular challenges working on a, on a, in the stage? The stage of the crest was quite, it was 29 <laughs> feet wide and 19 feet deep. I mean, was that yeah. particularly... Uh, well, I mean, it, it, I, I'm sure other people have told you, uh, because the curtain used to come down, it always came down in the middle of the set. There'd be a lot of furniture set in front of the, of the tab and a lot of furniture set behind. And what often happened in the play is that the curtain would go up and then for some reason in the mise-en-scene of the, of, the, of the play, you would start to move the furniture down so you'd get into a better playing area. But then you also knew when the act was concluding because some of the furniture would be carried back up stage. But it was a nice space to play in. It was an old movie house, that's true. It was a very comfortable space to play in. The only thing I remember is the that uh, I did a play once with Kate Reed, The Rainmaker, and uh, the director used to come and sit in the balcony every night, every night, and every time he did something you'd see a flashlight go on while he wrote a note, and it, it, there was this kind of more signaling going on and on while Henry Hatton wrote his notes, and you'd think, oh Henry, for God's sake, go and stay at home one night, you know. You had another story where working on Julius Caesar, I don't remember that, that one, uh, that was kind of interesting, humorous, I guess, uh, with uh, Donald Davis and Barbara, and you were a little tall. Oh, 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 right, isn't that about doing Twelfth Night at the Crest, yeah. Well, uh, at Stratford, uh, in that first year that I was there, Barbara uh, Chilcott was in the company, and as was Donald Davis, and uh, uh, Donald recognized, or maybe Barbara recognized that I look quite a bit like Donald. We both have kind of slightly anthropomoidal upper lips, you know, ape-like maybe. Uh, anyway, uh, I got to know them both and uh, I was interested in acting at the Crest and I don't know that I actually schmoozed them or anything about working at the Crest, but when it came time to do Twelfth Night, uh, which was the following season at the Crest, Barbara was playing Viola and uh, uh, they needed someone that looked like her to play her twin, Sebastian, so they asked me, but Barbara's not very tall and I'm six foot one. And there was a, a nice English director, a man called Basil Coleman, who would look at me on stage and then say, oh, you're so tall. <laughs> I thought, there's not much I can do about Basil. I mean, you could maybe look for a smaller actor if you wanted to, but otherwise I don't know what I'm going to do. And there is a, 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 a wonderful photograph of uh, the recognition scene with, uh, I'm standing beside Francis Highland and uh, Barbara Chilcott and, uh, and uh, mm, what's his name, playing her, her. Anyway, uh, Barbara Ch standing on the other side and the two of us are obviously being recognized as the twins. But if you look at the picture in long shot, I have my knees bent in order to to look like I'm approximately the same size as Barbara. And I, I hate to think, but I might have spent the whole of the performance with bent knees. I don't know. In 1961, you uh, came out into the Vancouver International Festival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what was your impressions of what was happening out here? Were you out here long enough to see what the theater scene was like? Not really. No, not really at all. Uh, that was a kind of an exotic experience. I had been studying in New York with Uta Hagen and Herbert Berghoff, and they had been invited by Nicky Goldschmidt to uh, to uh, form the theatre season, I think of the first festival, it would be 1961, I think, that we were here. And we brought a, an obscure play of Girardot's called Sodom and Gomorrah, and I don't know who suggested it, but it was now called Men, Women and Angels. Maybe it was a better selling point. We played in the Queen Elizabeth, which was enormous. And uh, there were about six of us came up from New York, and the rest of the company was made up of Vancouver actors whom Herbert had met here. And uh, I, I, I met them then uh, 
people that have become familiar names in Vancouver Theatre were in that company in those days. Uh, and apart from the friendships that I established out of that, no, I had no concept of what was going on here. None at all. Uh, Canada in those days was very regional. No, there was, there was a lot of arts coverage in the newspaper, in the local newspaper. I think more so than nowadays. If you did anything, you've got all kinds of press space. But you never knew what was going on in the next city at all. That's when you first met Joy Coggill, I guess. Was, yep, was she was. Your, you saw, did you see her in the, in, as Puck before you met her? Or had you I think I must have, yes. And I, we had mutual friends and I knew who she was. And I, I think I remember meeting her at, uh, at a reception. She was a very good Puck, uh, rushing around in the Benjamin Britten thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I knew that she, she was running a very distinguished children's theatre company here. And uh, I had, uh, when I'd gone to theatre school, I'd worked with uh, another student, was John Milligan, who had been a, a friend and colleague of Joy's as well. So I knew something about Joy then. But uh, I didn't work with her until later, and uh, she, <laughs> she didn't know that much about me, obviously, either. I mean, I think she might vaguely have remembered who I was, but I remember being asked down to read through a play with Joy at Alberta Theatre Projects, and it was a two-hander, and they went down and I read the play, and after that, uh, after that I got a, uh, a call saying, would I like to do the play? And I thought, ah, oh, I know what happened. I was being vetted by Joy. Was this an actor that she wanted to work with or not? And uh, obviously I passed the test, and we, we've been good friends since. It wasn't long after that you returned to Calgary, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and been there for most of the time since. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Looking at your notes that you gave me, that I guess Workshop 14 and the uh, Musicians and Actors Club were the two sort of um, bases from which um, pro regional professional theatre started. Um, starting, I guess, we've talked about Workshop 14, I guess, was Betty's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. driving force. Who was behind uh, the other one? Hey, it was a man called Don Boys who, who started the Musician and uh, Actors Club. He had been a figure skater. He had been in... Uh, oh ice capades, and then it settled down in Calgary and simply decided he had done, he directed some Gilbert and Sullivan, I, as I remember, uh, but what was a new face in the very traditional, well-established uh, amateur theatre scene in Calgary, but he decided that he wanted to have a club where people would get together. And this was a revolutionary idea, uh, so he took an old, abandoned movie house called the Isis and built in the basement the Isis developed a, a club and through force of personality persuaded everybody to come and it became uh, a wonderful meeting place and at the same time they decided that upstairs there was this theater that wasn't being used they would start a series of plays and their first play was a huge success and uh, and so all the theater life began to gravitate towards the Mac and workshop, uh, I think, pooled finally their theatre resources. They had a storage space in East Calgary, and they gave them that, and their costumes and things like that, and I suppose some funding. Uh, and they became MAC-14 as a producing unit at the theatre, at the uh, ISIS theatre. And then, because he had been very generous in encouraging all the theatre groups to come together in the club, he received a lot of support from what had been a fairly divisive scene, as it always is sometimes in amateur theatre. So, yeah, I know it always is in amateur theatre. It was this group and you belonged to that group, or there was this group and you belonged to that group. And Don began to smudge those lines of affiliation. So lots of people would be in lots of things together. And then uh, the amateurs decided that it was very important that professional theatre be established. And there was a slow move on the part of the MAC to be begin to bring in actors from the East, uh, professional actors from the East, to do the plays. And they began to mix amateur and, uh, and professional casts together, and then uh, continued the push for the establishment of, of, of a fully professional theatre. And then Chris Newton came and changed the name of MAC-14 to Theatre Calgary, and that was the first professional theatre we had. Um. There were, uh, you mentioned the ISIS theater. 
I don't know if you could give a brief description of places like, you know, there was a Jubilee Auditorium. What was that like? <laughs> well, the Jubilee Auditorium, this was a, a gift from the province. Uh, Albert had begun to accrue an awful lot of oil royalties, and it came uh, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the province, and they built two very glamorous, large theater spaces, one in Edmonton and one Calgary, and they're exactly identical. If you're inside, you wouldn't know which city you were in. Uh, and they, they, the government architects spent a year traveling in Europe to try and find what the best design was, and they came up with the Jubilee Auditorium. So it's an all-purpose house, but it's huge. The rake uh, of the seating in the second, in the galleries, is so shallow that you can't see the scene and the stage unless you lean up. It was supposed to, it was advertised as having perfect acoustics, but they're perfect acoustics if you have the microphones on. Otherwise, it can't be heard very easily. It was a, a terrible space for the symphony and has only been rectified in Calgary by the establishment of the Jack Singer Hall now because they played in amongst a lot of curtains on the stage so the sound was always muffled and they used to have to build band shells and things and I think they still do in Edmonton until they get their new concert hall built. Um, it's, it's fine for Les Mis but it, it's never been much of a space before that. When it was first opened, the amateur theatre tried to use the space, and they all came together to do a production of As You Like It. I was away during those years in Calgary. I gather it was, first of all, it cost them so much money to try and find enough scenery to cover this huge space that they were broke before they opened. And then when people went to see them, they, they were shouting, and so there was no subtlety in the performances at all. And the only time it was used after that by the amateurs was in musicals. I think there were one or two other plays done there, and they just got swamped by the space. So, uh, what happened in Calgary was uh, they developed a new theatre. Uh, it was called the Allied Arts Theatre. The Allied Arts was a, an organization cal in Calgary of all the artists coming together, and they came together in a, in a very grand old mansion in Calgary's prestigious district, Mount Royal. And a man called Archie Key had persuaded all these people to come together. Uh, the city had taken over this piece of property because there were no taxes being paid on it, so it was given to the arts group. And it was a very vital uh, and a very active place. There wasn't enough room for the theatre. Eventually, Archie moved that out of that house into an old uh, farm implements warehouse in Calgary on 9th Avenue and established some very nice gallery spaces, and then they tried to make a theatre out of the showroom for tractors and combines and things, and, and that was the first theatre. It, it was supposed to be all-purpose. It had a, a, a rake at the back, then a long flat floor, and then a raised stage that looked like something you would find in a high school auditorium. And that's where Theatre Calgary was until they moved to, to the new space developed by the Performing Arts Centre. It was never very satisfactory. There was the Buskins Cottage. What yep. was that? What was that? Well, the, the, the cottage schools were, uh, strange enough, they were two-story wooden structures and they were some of the early schools in Calgary. And there was one in East Calgary, the industrial district of Calgary, at the, the Buskins. Uh, the school board no longer used it and they rented it at a nominal rent from the, from the school board and developed a, a small theatre which seated 60 people upstairs. And the stage was a little corner of the room and the other people, people just sort of sat around. And, it was very intimate <laughs> with 60 people. Uh. Sounds like it. Now, was the Art Center Theatre, was that the one you just described? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Okay. Um, could you tell me a little bit about the Children's Theatre Company that was part of uh, the Calgary Art Center? I mean, how did, who's, who was driving force behind that? Yeah, I, I, I seem to have been, I remember being on a board uh, of the Allied Arts Theatre and meeting Joyce Doolittle, who was a, an American woman who had come up to Calgary because her husband was teaching at the newly established University of Calgary. And Joyce knew that I had something to do with that board and wanted to persuade me that they should develop a children's theatre program. And I don't know whether I persuaded the board or it's probably more likely Joyce did the persuading herself. But anyway, they, they began to do children's theatre and it proved highly successful. And uh, then when the MAC-14 was established, Joyce also did some children's theatre at the MAC-14. Uh, then when uh, the MAC-14 was on full operation, they employed Patty Campbell and Doug Risk to run the children's section of that theatre company. And 
I don't know whether it quite carried on into Theatre Calgary. Probably did uh, under Doug. But Doug later became the director of something called the Alberta Theatre Projects, which is the other major professional house in Calgary now. The, the, the theatre uh, the scene was uh, the traditional children's play done for children. Uh, it was only with Doug that uh, at his program at Alberta Theatre Projects that you began to have original works written specifically for children and in that house they were very often on Alberta history themes. How much influence, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm correct, Doug Riss, did he come from Manitoba Theatre Centre? No. Okay. But just with regards to the Manitoba Theatre Centre, which opened in '58, yeah. it was at that time perceived as maybe the model. I mean, did it have? Did people venture from Calgary to go there? Did they? Did they have? It, did it have any influence on uh, the direction <laughs> of uh, what was happening in Calgary? No, no one in Calgary goes to Winnipeg willingly. I don't think, you know, because it's cold in Calgary. It might go and be even colder on Portage and Maine. But I don't. I don't remember that. I mean, certainly I was aware of what was happening. I think, in in uh, Winnipeg. I had n I had actually been asked to go up and join the company. I was in New York and uh, and uh, someone from the theatre came down and, and, and looked at the various people in the, in the studio at the time and uh, and they were doing a streetcar named Desire and, and they said to me, well do you think you could play Mitch? And I thought, no, I, I can't play Mitch. So I chose not to go and that was that would be just at the time that Sean was was establishing the company, um, so I, so I was aware that it was there, and uh, but it always seemed a phenomenon. It was a peculiar thing that you know, Toronto still didn't have a really well established theatre. Well, I suppose it did have the Crest, but only one. And there was Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba, with a flourishing regional theatre. I remember meeting uh, Tom Hendry, who was one of the guiding forces in the establishment and continuation of that company. But, uh, and then suddenly there were plays to be done, Canadian plays to be done, which seemed to have come from Manitoba. Going back to the, uh, the Mac, uh, the qu quote which I got through your uh, background was that cold night of 1964 when Don Boy's production of A Taste of Honey opened at the Mac Theatre can now be seen as one of the most significant dates in the history of the arts in Calgary. Do you concur with that, or is that overblown, or is that...? Well, I, I, I think I, you might say in retrospect it is. I, I'm not sure that I knew that it was at the time. It was a very good production, and, and I, what was distinctive about it, of course, was that it was a completely modern play. Whereas Calgary had always done things which had had the, the approval of Broadway or the West End and had waited until the rights were released and there was enough publicity that they could, or a film had been made, that they could have something that people would come to see. And uh, The Taste of Honey was a, a very good play, considered in those days rather controversial. And the fact that, John, that Don chose to do a production of it and the fact that they did it well and the fact that there was an audience for it was an eye-opener for people. So in that sense, yeah, it is significant, I think. Uh, because shortly after that we got plays like The Knack, uh, the, the Caretaker, uh, The Birthday Party, and plays that no one would ever considered that there would to be an audience for. Uh, when I came back from New York at the Buskins, I did a, uh, a production of Zoo Story, and that was considered highly radical in those days. But I mean, it was only a house of 60 people, so you could find 60 people willing to experiment with something that was out of the ordinary for them. But Don had a theatre of about 300, I'm not quite sure what the seating capacity was, about 300, 350, and filled it night after night with his production. So in that sense, yeah, I think it is a significant change. And I guess you'd have to say, you know, uh, Don was the driving force behind you know, what did he I mean? You've talked about him a bit. Was there any more you could say about him in terms of what he brought and uh, what he? <laughs> but uh, I mean, his his major quality was his enthusiasm, and also his because he was enthusiastic, he could never see what would be the downside of things. Therefore, he was really quite courageous in going ahead. And other people would say, "Well, you know, no, no one will ever come to see that play, Doc," but he didn't pay much attention to that. And uh, the naysayers proved to be wrong. Yeah, he had this great enthusiasm, and he, 
that extended to the performers themselves. People used to go down to the Mac and on Friday nights there would be a kind of cabaret and it was always fit up over the week by a few people and put together and some good musicians playing as well. So there was an air of, uh, because Don approved, the fact that you said you were a singer, Don thought you should be singing. The fact that you were an actor meant that you should be acting and because you said that, you must have some some merit and therefore you should be able to do this. And uh, Sometimes people without merit were doing things, but very often it was a discovery that there was more talent in the city than you knew, and it was great fun to sit and watch them do things. In 1968, uh, Theva Calgary uh, brought Christopher Newton. Mm -hmm. what, did, uh, what did Christopher Newton bring to Theva Calgary? Oh, well, prestige, first of all. I think, you know, he, he truly was a professional. Uh, he had been in Calgary before playing Orsino in a road show from Stratford of Twelfth Night. I remember meeting him then. Uh, uh, he too brought an enormous enthusiasm. He thought that the theatre could exist in Calgary and he was going to prove that it could. And his seasons were challenging for Calgary anyway. I mean, not many Calgarians would ever have considered scheduling The Alchemist in their first season, you know, Ben Johnson. But but we had that from, from Chris. Uh, he also brought all of the professional theatre that had developed in other parts of the country to Calgary because we saw very excellent Canadian actors. And uh, before that, you know, the mark of approval had to be either England or, or the States for Calgary, someone but not necessarily Canadian. So there was a great enthusiasm and support, I thought, in those early days. I'm sure not, but maybe not. Maybe he had to fight for his audience, as any theatre director does in Canada. But I remember lots and lots of full houses in the early days of Theatre Calgary, and lots of excitement about the fact that uh, the season was coming forth. Was there anything uh, uh, particularly memorable about opening night of 1968? Um... No, I, I, I don't remember that. I mean, the, the excitement of the theatre had opened, but it had opened with uh, uh, The Odd Couple. And that was a very traditional choice. It was only, I, I was in the second play, which is The Alchemist, and it was only with The Alchemist I thought that you had a feeling that there was a new wind blowing through Calgary because uh, here we had Eric Donkin and uh, Kenny Welsh and a, a good company in uh, Ben Johnson and me, uh, Ben Johnson made very available through that production to the Calgary audiences and they enjoyed it and I thought, ah, oh, there are new things happening in Calgary. And Christopher was very, very easy to work for, very encouraging. Uh, a wonderful director of a company, as he's proved with uh, long success at Shaw. And here in Vancouver, too. Did he direct in those first two years? A lot, a lot, right. yeah. Right. Because there wasn't the money to have second directors around. And uh, Patty Armstrong was the, uh, what was she, the promotional woman lady. And, and Patty is an enormous enthusiast. So. You had two really enthusiastic people, and when you would go to the theatre, they seemed delighted to have you there, and again, uh, felt that you were going to do good work, and, and consequently you tried very hard to do good work. Was it, and as there was Nathan Cohen in Toronto and, and Herbert Whitaker, was uh, Jamie Portman the sort of the person that... It was the only, he was the only critic in town. Uh, and that's not true, there was another critic, but I never remember who that would be, uh, because there was a second newspaper in Calgary. But, but Jamie, like Herbert Whitaker, is in that same mold, feels that it was his duty to criticize, to criticize and constructively and to encourage the theatre, to persuade the so-called rednecks of Calgary that the, the theatre was the place that they should come to. So he did that a lot. Uh, he could be critical, but, but he was always an encourager. So uh, you were mentioning that the, uh, there was another key sort of uh, development in terms of theatre in Calgary. Yeah, th that, that, that's the establishment of the Alberta Theatre Projects by Doug Risk and Lucille Wagner. Uh, Doug, as we've talked about before, came to Calgary in order to run the children's theatre section of Mac 14 and Theatre Calgary. And with his then wife, Patty Campbell, who was a playwright, they moved on to wanting to form their own company. And what was happening, fortunately, was that a heritage building was being established, a heritage park, rather, was being established in Calgary. And they brought down an old log concert hall from Canmore, a mining town, 
called the Canmore Opera House. Now it was just a big, large wooden uh, log hall. And they built a little platform at the end of it and they were going to run a season of plays out of that. And they persuaded the historical park that they would be relevant because they would do plays about Alberta history. And they would do uh, children's programs about Alberta history. And that, those two things together, teaching children in Alberta history you know, guarantees money in Calgary. So on that basis they started a company and the, the plays were well done, the, the subjects were well handled, and then they decided they, they might try and find a larger audience. So with some of the pieces that they did, they expanded them into an evening program. And I remember them doing a play, which was a huge success for them at the time, called Horse Muse, which was about Bob Edwards, the famous drunken newspaper editor of Calgary's early days. And uh, the audiences loved that. It was a huge hugely supported in Calgary and was done over and over and over again in the in the early 70s. It's very dated now. I don't think anybody would want to revive it, but it was typical of what Doug wanted to do. Then he and Lucille decided that because there was a success, there was an adult audience at the Opera House and people liked to go to this old space. It, it was constantly improved as a theatre space and, and an adult season was developed and a very, very faithful following that company. And their plays became uh, broader and broader in scope. Um, some of them were, uh, there seemed to be a lot of attention to Canadian plays and, and they were the first theatre company to establish a playwright in residence and one of the first was John Morrell and one of his plays that proved a huge success and continues to be a success is Waiting for the Parade which is about Calgary women during the First World, for the Second World War uh, waiting for men to come back from, from that war. And uh, Sharon Pollock was also a playwright in residence at that time, and, and you get several of Sharon's plays, which s again have an Alberta historic base, because that still seemed to be something of the mandate that Doug had for that theatre. But they, he was all, they were also encouraged to write other things as well. And uh, both playwrights, would, I think, would, would acknowledge the support that they got for the development of, of uh, their writing from that company. And uh, it, was a, it was an interesting space to play, and it was very tiny. And uh, to try and find your way backstage was always an, an obstacle course, because in order to get, uh, like they were doing plays like a Generation, which has a multiple set, uh, 15 Miles of Broken Glass, which is again, all those Canadian plays seem to have at least one bedroom, one living room, one outdoor set, and to find this on a postage side stage was always it was a brilliant designer called Rick Roberts who could always find a lot of space there. Uh, but sometimes getting on stage was a real hazard because you had to wind your way through such complicated backstage scenery to find the door onto the set. It was a nice place to play, lovely place to play. And a lot of people really regretted when finally uh, a decent space was built for ATP at the Performing Arts Centre, that they could no longer go to the Opera House in the park. So would you say, what would be the, the, uh, the biggest difference between what you would, uh, Theatre Calgary was doing and... and, and well, and I... Uh, I or were they similar? Whether it's fair to say, it seemed to me that in the early days, Alberta Theatre's project was much more Canadian-based in its content. We were far more likely to see a new play untried in their season, or a Canadian play that had been done recently somewhere else in their season. And Theatre Calgary for a long time seemed a very conservative company. That's not entirely true. They did do some new plays. I remember them doing a premiere of a W. O. Mitchell, for example, and, and other ones too, but that was my perception. What's happened in Calgary is that the one company balances the other because they're rivals companies. So you have uh, you, you benefit as the play as the playgoer because the two companies are trying to outdo each other in their seasons and so once season is announced the other season tries to compensate for what they're not covering to our advantage. Calgary's always been a very good town for new playwrights too. Um, we still have the new playwright festival every year which is four weeks of new Canadian plays and and with the tradition of Alberta Theatre Projects to find new playwrights and, and encourage new playwrights, and Theatre Calgary has picked up on that as well. There's always been a fair amount of original theatre done out of Calgary. Going back 
uh, back in time, uh, one of the things I, I'm dealing with is looking at because television and radio were the, were where the food was for a lot of people, <laughs> yes, a lot of actors. So, yeah. so I, I think you have to sort of uh, at least mention it in in some ways of what was going on and mm-hmm. trying to paint a picture, I guess, in terms of the challenges that you may have faced as a performer, especially in those days uh, with the technology being in its infancy and probably even the direction in its infancy. I mean, uh, how would you, I mean, how was it as an experience uh, coming from stage to walk into a sound stage? And oh, it was a terrifying, terrifying experience. Well, the medium was new. Uh, th- uh, th- this is this would be in the early fifties in Toronto. I'm talking about uh, having come back from the first season of Stratford and deciding that I was going back to Toronto. Then to try and find a way to earn a living, the, the, your options were the crest if you could get in, or you, what television you could pick up on radio. Radio seemed a very closed shop. There were Andrew Allen's people who had been he had for years and years, and there wasn't much chance to find your way into that at all. It seemed to me, but television was very new, and there were four or five hotshot young directors who had taken a course a couple of years before and were doing all kinds of productions, one a week out of Toronto, it seems to me. And you would go up to the old CBC offices on Jarvis Street and you would go from desk to desk and try and find if you could get a part on television. And then when you got a part, uh, because it was live, you had very complicated sets again, crowded into very small studios with someone, uh, an, an ASF or some sort, to, to guide you from one entrance to the other so that you wouldn't get lost and could be there for the next shot, which would uh, be the uh, coming into a new set. And, and because people were learning uh, a, a story about the camera moves getting so complicated and the cables uh, from the cameras getting so twisted together that finally the cameras were locked together in the middle of the studio shooting one another because <laughs> they couldn't move. So, you know, it was in its infancy. It was very nervous because it was live. It was like being in the theatre, uh, except you didn't have the support of the audience, and because the camera was so much more intrusive, it was so much more uh, in your face, uh, that if you were nervous, and sometimes that nervousness you can cover on in a stage performance on an opening night, and you only have one shot at in television, and you're nervous, and, and the, the technical demands are are unfamiliar to you, and uh, I, 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 th- I, th- I thought it was a terrifying medium. I was always so happy that I didn't have to do that much of it because I had a job at the Crest. Who were some of the people that uh, that there were that you do you remember who you worked with at that time? Oh, uh, Henry Kaplan, who I've mentioned before, Sylvia Narizzano, uh, uh Mario Prezak. Um, Anyone from the Crest or Stratford that came in and worked with you on? Oh, I, all the actors that were in the crest at some point were in television. I mean, it was a small body of actors in, in that community at that time. It was a very kind of friendly place to be, you know. The fact that you announced that you were actor, an actor meant that you had an entree to a kind of well-established social group. And everybody sat night after night in the, what was it called, Chez Paris on Bloor Avenue, and that's where you went to be seen and see your friends. And it was a very small, intimate group, so you knew most of the actors in Toronto. I mean, someone as distinguished as John Draney, you knew at a distance, as he had been this great voice and fine actor of Canadian radio for years and years and years, but occasionally you'd find yourself in a television show with, with John Draney. Was oh. that an intimidating process? No, no, I know, no, Canadian actors are not on the whole, they used to be, even in my day, intimidating. And, and that's not my, that's not my experience of the theatre, is that one actor intimidates another. I mean, once you heard horror stories of, of Broadway in London where Ruth Gordon comes down to the stage and says of Alec Guinness, this, this man is hopeless, can't we find another actor? And Tarun Guthrie fires him. Uh, but I've never had that experience in the theatre. I've never had that kind of conflict. Maybe a few battles about egos of some actors when they're insecure, but on the whole they're a very supportive profession. I was just curious. One thing you mentioned going back to the crest briefly. Um, you did a play by Robertson Davies. Did, was he there? Did he come in? Yep. Part mm-hmm, of it? Mm-hmm, what were you? you know, I'm just. We like to speak. The, the, the play was called Hunting Stewart, as I remember, uh, and not one of his great successes. The crest had had a, a history of that. They, their first play was a Jig for the Gypsy, which was a play written about the Davies family 
and then performed by the Davises. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, he was around and about as. Do you have any impressions of him as a young uh, playwright? Uh? Well, he was a bit more intimidating than most. I mean, simply because he's this very articulate, very suave, very English gentleman. You know. But uh, I, you know, I, I, I'd had an experience of Robertson Davies before I'd met him uh, when I was at university. Uh, a group of young actors were sent on a tour of the province, really small towns, playing three plays of Roberts and Davies. And one was a very sophisticated comedy called Eros at Breakfast, which took place inside a young man's stomach. Well, I mean, it might have been fine for, for a cultured audience in Toronto. In, in Balzac in, in Alberta, they were quite baffled by what we were doing. So, but, um, and we had done six weeks touring of small towns in Alberta with his plays. So it's a pleasure to meet him, finally. Uh, he, he was very well behaved in the theatre, and as much as a, as, a, as a writer, he seemed quite willing to let the actors and the directors get on with it. And if, if he was critical, and I, I never heard that, he would have the discussion, I presume, with the, with the director. Is there anything I missed, or I'm, I'm no, sort of... Uh, I don't think so. Okay, that's great. Hmm. Well, that was easy, John. The puzzle is slowly coming together. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah I'd like to check my notes, because you sure Doug didn't work at uh, the Winnipeg Theatre, right? I would name... There well, the, but his brother, there's another risk who... Sydney, but I don't think they're related. No, 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 it's not that. What's his brother's name? Who, for many years, was the... Uh, Administrator uh, for the Winnipeg Ballet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's and it could be that he is a Winnipeg boy. I know he's not from Calgary, but I thought it was Edmonton that he came from.